Okay, I think we should get started. Um, so, so first of all, uh, it's, it's wonderful to welcome everybody to this event, which is jointly hosted by uh, myself, the UNESCO Chair at the University of Bristol, uh, and uh, the uh, Future of Edu Futures of Education Initiative at UNESCO, and the Bristol Conversations in Education. Uh, we're delighted to see so many people here. What we hope will be a really uh, useful and interesting conversation. And we very much hope that this will feed into uh, the Futures of Education uh, initiative, which we'll hear a little bit about in a moment. Um, so this is the first of three webinars that are, are in the series Decolonizing Education for Sustainable Futures. And I'll talk about the other two in a moment. Um, but I would like to start off by just uh, introducing uh, my co-convener, first of all, um, Dr. Keith Holmes, uh, who is a program specialist in UNESCO's Future of Learning and Innovation team. Um, Keith is currently involved in the team's education research and foresight activities, especially in the area of higher education. Um, we're also joined by a very distinguished panel today, uh, and that includes um, Professor Noah Sobi, who is a senior project officer leading on the Futures of Education Initiative at UNESCO. Um, he's also the past president of the Comparative International Education Society in the US, and for his day job, he's professor of educational policy studies at Loyola University, Chicago. Um, I'm also delighted that we'll be joined on the panel by Veronica Pasini Kitchabal, who is Professor of Early Childhood Education in the Faculty of Education at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. She's a member of the Commonwealth Research Collective, and there are other members of the collective in the audience, and we're really pleased uh, to be welcoming them too. Um, uh, uh, Veronica, like uh, Catherine, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, have both been involved in producing background papers for the uh, Futures of Education initiative. And they'll be talking a little bit about those as well. Um, uh, Veronica has co-authored more than 40 peer-reviewed articles, six books, uh, including some, some children's books. And she's the co-editor of the open access journal of Childhood Studies in the Bloomsbury book series, Feminist Thought in Childhood Research. So Veronica, you're most welcome. I'm also delighted that, uh, that uh, Professor Catherine Alum Adoro Hoppers is able to join us today. Um, Professor Hoppers is UNESCO expert in basic education, lifelong learning, information systems, and on science and society. She's an expert in many things, uh, including uh, on disarmament. Um, she, she, she's an expert to the World Economic Forum and to the World Intellectual Property Organization. She previously held a national chair in South Africa, prestigious Saatchi chair in development education. Uh, she's a member of the uh, Academy of Science of South Africa and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's had a long and distinguished career and uh, we're delighted to, to, uh, to, to include her on our panel today. Um, so in terms of the running order for today, um, what we're going to do is show, play a short video uh, and then uh, we'll, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Sobi, who will introduce a little bit about the uh, Futures of Education initiative. And then each of the panelists will make a short presentation uh, leaving plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, then there'll be uh, 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 an opportunity at the end uh, for the panelists just to make some final uh, brief uh, comments. So um, to start off with then, uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, uh, Christy, if you wouldn't mind showing the video.
What kinds of futures do we want to shape? Accelerated climate change. Artificial intelligence and biotechnology. Increasing exclusion and fragmentation. Our world is becoming more complex and uncertain with many disruptive challenges. Knowledge and learning are humanity's greatest renewable resources for responding to challenges and inventing alternatives. Yet, education doesn't only respond to a changing world. Education transforms the world. But to create the futures we want, we must rethink education. UNESCO has launched a global initiative to reimagine how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet. We are looking at 2050 and beyond. And we want to partner with you to discuss, debate and re-envision the ways education enables us to become what we want to become. For ourselves. For each other. Thinking together so we can act together. Join the conversation and let's make the futures we want. That's wonderful. So um, if I could uh, turn over to you, uh, Noah. Uh, perhaps you could just uh, add a little bit of uh, flesh to the bones about the Futures of Education initiative for us. Thanks, Leon. Uh, I'm very happy to. Uh, just making sure my sound's coming through okay. Seems like it is. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Noah Sobi. Uh, as Leon mentioned, I helped to lead on uh, UNESCO's new Futures of Education initiative. Uh, I will just give a brief introduction uh, to the project, where things stand. Um, and I actually want to comment a bit on that video, um, which I haven't seen for a couple months. Um, <clears throat> at the core of this project is the question of how we use uh, knowledge and learning to shape the futures we want for humanity, for the planet. And this is an assess the state of the field uh, envisioning exercise that UNESCO has undertaken uh, about every quarter century, so every generation, if you will. Uh, so the Futures of Education Learning to Become initiative follows in the footsteps of two previous UNESCO global reports, the 1972 Four Commission Learning to Be and the 1996 Delore Commission Learning the Treasure Within reports. Whether you're familiar with those or not, what's important is that in this iteration, uh, we have an international commission, this time headed by the president of Ethiopia, uh, Madam Sally Work Zuda, is frankly a significant difference from the past. Uh, and there's also a, a, a pretty robust global consultation and co-construction dimension. Um, that's what uh, brings us here today. Um, we have uh, organized now about 360 focus groups in all parts of the world with close to 6,000 participants. We have online platforms uh, that encourage people to submit ideas, artwork. Um, there's a short survey. Uh, we can put links to this, all of this in the chat. Um, we've had about 100,000 particip people uh, participating uh, on our online platforms uh, and then through events and webinars like this, uh, we've had close to uh, three quarters of a million other people engaging uh, with the Futures uh, Initiative. We've also activated a wide range of uh, educational stakeholders and experts. Uh, we've commissioned background papers on a range of topics, published think pieces by UNESCO chairs. Uh, some of the people um, on the panel today have contributed to that. So the goal is to generate a conversation um, that uh, will help to shape the Futures of Education report that's gonna come out in November of 2021, November of this year, um, but then that's gonna continue beyond. Um, and that's the key. That's a key piece. Uh, why we why we refer to this as an initiative. Uh, let me uh, just a quick comment on on that video. It's interesting. Um, <clears throat> uh, you notice immediately no one was wearing masks. Um, 
We made it in August, uh, September of 2019. When you watch it now, you have to wonder, of course, what our, our post-pandemic world will be like. Um, when we launched the project at uh, the UN General Assembly in September of that year, I think at the time, um, people thought that the futures of education was a fine thing, a nice to have, but not necessarily a need to have. Then with the global health pandemic, I think there was this sense, you know, you often saw it uh, reflected in the idea that the future has arrived, the future is now, um, leaving that aside. I think we are all aware that uh, this is a very potent moment, that many decisions made now in the short term will have significant uh, long-term future sh uh, shaping consequences. Uh, and I think there's some key lessons to draw. Um, you know, around how we think about uh, futures. Um, you know, it's worth noting that basically every scenarios exercise that's been run over the last 30 years involved the global health pandemic that shut down, uh, you know, global economies and societies. So in a sense, you know, we were hit by the train that we've been seeing coming for decades. Um, and maybe the lesson there is that <clears throat> we can do the foresight work pretty well but we really need to get a lot better at the anticipation part. So I think one thing that uh, um, many need to recognize is that successful future literacy is in part about coming to terms with the reality of uncertainty. Um, and that's not a new uh, lesson for many, um, not one that COVID needed to deliver, um, but that it's also about recognizing that sometimes our quest for certainty might get us into more trouble and that part of anticipating the future is recognizing that it's fundamentally unknowable and open. Um, I also think that we've gotten a useful lesson that dramatic change is possible. Uh, in many parts of the world, we saw basically overnight just how quickly change can occur. Uh, of course, it turns out that problems don't just magically disappear, uh, but fundamental transformations in how we organize our economic life, our social life, our educational life are possible. Um, so that, trans that transformation is possible is, is another lesson I think we might draw from the pandemic. But I, I think it's important that we not conclude that building pandemic resilience, which everyone is talking about and probably needs to, uh, but building pandemic resilience doesn't prepare us to face all possible futures. Uh, I think we should expect that in the future, disruptions will likely come from expected and unexpected angles. Uh, so in this Futures of Education initiative, uh, we. We're taking the approach that it's important to expand our capacities for imagining multiple possible future scenarios. Possible futures might include jobless societies, might include bioenhancement that reshapes human beings fundamentally, might include a drastic reduction in the spaces of a planet that are suitable for human habitation, but possible futures might also be wondrous and, and, and full of abundance. Um, so I think it's important that we consider predicted and probable futures alongside uh, desired and alternative futures. And, and when we reflect on different ways that education might develop in the future, um, we need to be simultaneously thinking about education um, for the futures. And this, I think, is where one of the key uh, places where the conversation uh, that uh, Leon and colleagues at Bristol have organized really comes in because the value in unsettling our assumptions uh, uh, and expanding the range of the possible lies in bringing those perspectives into present action. Um, so uh, if the future is now, uh, um, you know, it, or it seems more now more than ever, um, let's, let's uh, take advantage of that. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to also just comment on, draw your attention to, to one final thing um, I suspect you've picked up. Uh, for us, it's very important, uh, and that's that uh, UNESCO is referring to this as the futures in the plural of education. Um, there's a, several reasons for this. Uh, one is, is kind of a pragmatic uh, uh, recognition that there will be multiple futures of education, but two, that that's desirable. Um, you know, for too long, we've had uh, single futures imposed, uh, futures envisioned from 
uh, certain parts of the world imposed on other parts of the world. Um, and so uh, a world of multiple futures of education, I think, is, is quite desirable. And I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation uh, today and over the next several weeks on how we think about decolonizing those futures. Uh, back over to you, Leon. Okay, many thanks indeed, uh, Noah, for that wonderful introduction. Really comprehensive and useful, I think, for everybody to get a, a grip on what the initiative is all about. And uh, very invitational too. Um, it's important that people feel that they can contribute to it. And I see from the chat that we have people here from uh, Jordan, from South Africa, from Arizona, uh, from Tunisia, um, from Tanzania, from Brazil, uh, from all, from Finland, and those are just the first the first countries that that uh, that come off the the chat. So a warm welcome to to everybody. Also from Bath, which is 14 miles down the road from me. So that's uh, that's also good to see. Okay, um, just a brief housekeeping uh, point that uh, if you do have questions for the panelists, please do pop them in the Q and A. If you have general comments or things that you want to share with, with the, the collective, with the uh, uh, people who, who are in the, the webinar, then please use the, uh, the chat function as well. But for, for the panelists, if you have questions for us, please pop them in the Q&A, and my colleagues, Raphael and Julia, will be monitoring those and collating those. All right, so uh, I'm going to share my screen now and uh, give my brief uh, input. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Right, so let me just see here. Okay, I hope you can see the see the screen. Um, so this is uh, this is from uh, what I'll be talking about is uh, you can read more about in in a uh, a book that I've recently uh, published. Um, but basically, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what we understand by sustainable futures. Uh, uh, generally, and also how that links to ideas about decolonization. So I think, you know, we continue to be very dominated by ideas about growth, uh, the future being linked to ideas about um, uh, economic growth. And I think if we listen to our leaders in all parts of the world, we, we hear this constant rhetoric around economic growth and how it will trickle down and that that's the basis for sustainable futures. But of course, we know that growth has had uh, really awful effects, both in terms of, uh, uh, of the environment or un un untrammeled growth, I should say, has had uh, very undesirable effects on the environment and also on issues to do with, uh, with equality uh, and so on. We're seeing increases in equality as well as the threats of biosphere collapse. Um, I think it's also the case that our views about education, about futures, about sustainable futures, continue to be shaped within a, a very Western frame of reference. And uh, this is Rostow's model of development. And I think it still, you know, underlies lots of thinking when people think about sustainable futures and what the future means. They think about it uh, in, in modernist terms as a kind of a, a stepping from a traditional society to a high mass consumption society. So um, development is often perceived in very linear and in very Western terms. Now it's not always the case. Uh, this is from Kate Roweth's uh, recent book on donut economics. And here she's kind of encapsulating thinking that goes back to uh, the, the club of Rome and other ways of thinking about sustainable development or sustainable futures. And uh, she's identified here, her model of, it's called donut economics. She, she presents uh, uh, economic and social development and environmental development as being very interlinked. And we need to, 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 to develop but within planetary boundaries and taking good care of the core of the donut, which is about uh, sustainable uh, futures for, for humanity and for the planet. So within the Western 
epistem, if you like, the Western frames of thought, there are different ways of conceiving sustainable futures. Um, but I want to argue that actually, you know, what we're missing here are other ways of understanding uh, sustainable futures and that education is really implicated in that. What do we understand by the future? What ways of understanding do we privilege? What kinds of knowledge and in whose language? Language is a very important factor in all of this. And how does our knowledge about the future uh, uh, take place and in whose interests? So I want to start off by just talking a little, just uh, uh, referring to, to work by uh, Boaventura de Souza Santos. And he talks about the, the role of Western knowledge and, and of, of Western universities in processes of what he describes as epistemicide. So we're living now in a, in a condition of coloniality where you know, Western frames of reference dominate. And he argues that there are five main ways in which that domination takes place. Uh, first of all is the valorization, the assertion of modern science and high culture, read Western culture, as the sole criteria for truth and aesthetic quality. Also, he identifies the dominance of a Western linear view of time. And we've seen that in relation to thinking about development, that it's a a linear process that's not contested and unproblematic. And of course, that we know quite the opposite. We also know that different uh, civilizations, uh, different cultures think about time very differently. Some more cyclically, for example, um, and, and, and others in terms much more of, of emergence and of connection with, with the planet. But also Western knowledge and you know, the academy's been complicit in this uh, has also excluded other ways of knowing the world through processes of classification, whether it's eugenics uh, or uh, other kinds of, of, uh, of scientific racism that have sought to naturalize differences between peoples of the world. Also the universalizing assumptions of Western knowledge that actually you know, they hold objectively true and in a way that doesn't take account of different understandings of ethics, different contexts, different languages and different realities. And the logic of productivity, that economic growth becomes the sole criteria through which development and progress are evaluated. And uh, this, of course, is, is highly uh, problematic for the reasons we've, we've discussed. So education has been complicit in these processes. It's been absolutely central to the processes of epistemicide that Boaventura de Souza Santos describes. And, you know, much of my research has been on the African continent. And of course, you know, Western education, if you like, was brought by the missionaries. You know, first we had the land and you had the, the Bible. Now we've got the Bible and you've got the land. So, you know, colonialism was, was a, a not only uh, about conquering territory, but also about conquering hearts and minds. The, the idea of education, the, the idea of modern education remains very shaped uh, by, by the colonial model. Uh, that old adage, stand in line, be on time, kiss the rod and trust in God. And you can see here, you know, on the, on the left, you have a, a mission school. On the right, you have a modern school in Ghana. And you can see across, across the shoulder, across his knee there is a cane. And everyone's uh, sitting in, in neat rows. So in that sense, you know, the, the modernist project has been perpetrated. There's still education uh, research has had been uh, underpinned by uh, the long shadow of scientific and cultural racism. Uh, whether it's uh, Laura Bartman, uh, the example of the Hottentot woman who was paraded during Victorian times as, as an ex example of an exotic other, or whether it's the practices of scientific racism that continue today that try to create hierarchies. And the Academy has been implicated in reproducing these. On the left here, you have, you know, the, the indigenous knowledge systems and 
you know, I, I visited the University of Butari once uh, in, in Rwanda before it became the University of Rwanda. And there was a professor there who was really keen on indigenous agriculture. And there's so much that, that can, the Rwanda can benefit from indigenous agriculture. It works with the soil, with the weather systems there, but he couldn't get any funding. And at the same time, the government is obsessed with Western science as a way of progress. And of course, Western science is, can make, has a really important role to play in terms of development. But so we argue does indigenous knowledge and understandings. And the important thing is to bring those into conversation with each other. This is something that I, I think is really uh, important to understand about uh, coloniality, the language issue. And it's an issue that often gets marginalized. But on the left there, you have a map of Africa, pre-colonial Africa, which shows that the different language, the main language groups. On the right, you have uh, the colonial uh, map of Africa, which shows how indigenous languages have been fragmented and uh, replaced by, by uh, the colonial languages. And of course, when you damage people's languages, and this is what's happening in education all around the world, children in Africa are more than often being forced to change, adopt English at the age of, of eight or even, even before then, before they have the chance to form basic concepts. And of course, it means that they also become disconnected from in their indigenous and local cultures and knowledge systems too. So the language issue is important. But of course, all of this has been resisted. And this is important, I think, that you know, people, people have, have, have suggested alternatives, whether it's the Roads Must Form movement or the Black Lives Matter movement, People have resisted the effects of Eurocentrism and of racism in education. So I want to finish off by just outlining for, to get the discussion going, if you like, three dimensions of what a decolonizing education futures might look like. The first dimension, decolonizing the curriculum, is about not only challenging the Eurocentricism of the curriculum, the extent to which the disciplines as they've developed in the Western Academy have become so dominant at the expense of other systems, ways of knowing the world, but also the importance for all of our, our student, all of our learners of recognizing the value of diverse knowledge systems. It's not, it's not an argument for relativism. This is really just to say that actually the nature of reality, the complex nature of reality demands that we're able to draw on different ways of understanding the world if we're going to tackle that reality. But linked to decolonizing the curriculum is decolonizing research. Um, so we need to reorient our research so that it, it, it works with indigenous and other groups to develop knowledge that's relevant for people for sustainable futures for everybody. But at the heart of the transformation, is democratizing uh, the academy itself and the education system itself. Not only challenging institutionalized racism, which continues to discriminate particularly against our, our learners of color, uh, but also widening participation for those traditionally denied access to, to education and listening to students, listening to learners to learn a voice. We still, operate in education systems where faculty itself often isn't diverse. And we need to challenge that, we need to tackle that. Um, but also to break down the barriers between the university and the community. Um, so that we, we break down this idea of the university, you know, as an ivory tower. And to reorient education, to make it not so much about the market, and selling, selling uh, education and other commodities, but reorienting it for people and planet. So I've put these down here as a provocation, if you like. Um, I want to briefly mention our uh, research projects, and you can find this on, on the web. Uh, Raphael, perhaps you could put a link into the chat for this. But we're trying to do precisely this. We're trying to 
uh, to fund research in Rwanda, Somalia, South Africa, and India that involves communities with researchers and policymakers to develop new evidence that can support sustainable education futures. So that leads me to the overarching questions for our seminar series. So today we're asking about really the links between the idea of sustainable futures and decolonizing education. Next week, we're going to be, uh, where the session will be convened by, uh, by Yvette Hutchinson from the British Council. We'll be looking at how we can begin to decolonize our, our institutions. And I know Catherine will be talking a little bit about that later on today. And in the third, sem third uh, seminar in the series, be more forward looking, looking at the idea of reparative justice as a basis for which to rethink education futures. And that will be led by my, my uh, colleague, um, Arathi Shriprakashan and Julia Paulson. So this is the, this is the, the series. Um, and we, I very much hope that, uh, that we'll be welcoming you back uh, for, for those talks as well. But uh, that's, uh, that's quite enough of me for now. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, hand over to, to the, next, uh, the next speaker, um, who, is, uh, who is Veronica. So Veronica, when you're ready, over to you. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank Leon and Keith for inviting us to join this important event. And I say as because today, as Leon said in the introduction, I am joining as a founding member of the Common Worlds Research Collective. And as always, my colleagues, Africa Taylor, Mindy Blaze, and Iveta Silova are here with me. In fact, Mindy and Iveta are not only present in the ideas that I will share today, but also present in the audience, and I hope they will be able to join into the discussion later on. Uh, I am honored to speak with you today from Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lunapewak, and Natawandaran territory, what is now called London, Ontario in Canada, where I have the privilege to live, work, and um, raise my family. Before I address the questions that Leon proposed uh, to us, and the questions are how can we envis envisage education futures and how can we decolonize education futures, I want to spend a few minutes thinking about the significance of these questions, um, as well as the context in which I want to consider these questions. Uh, like you saw in the video, like Leon just uh, mentioned first, the questions are important because we live in a critical moment in which human forces have fundamentally altered the planet's geobiospheric systems. And they're triggering a cascade of ecological crisis and threatening the future of life on Earth as we have known it until now, including that of our own species. As the IPCC has declared, our, as our car carbon emissions continue to overheat the planet, we face a climatic trajectory of intensifying floods, droughts, and fires. And as we continue to clear forests, to destroy habitats, and to diminish biodiversity, we precipitate mass displacements and extinctions and create the conditions for ongoing devastating zoonotic pandemics, uh, like um, Noah mentioned earlier today. And second, and relatedly to this crisis, we live in a critical moment when we are called to question and to challenge the racialized and settler state violence that has been normalized around the globe. And like Leon said, um, we are called by movements such as Black Lives Matter that is important uh, for um, 
where I live today. So returning to um, the questions, I want to suggest that perhaps the future of education could be and needs to be redressing the root causes of these two crises. And for us in the Common World's uh, Research Collective, the root causes of these challenges is human exceptionalism. What we mean by human exceptionalism is the Euro-Western belief that humans can endlessly act upon the rest of the world without impunity or with impunity, I should say. The Cartesian dualisms that is structure the unswerving humanistic belief that our supreme rationality and the exclusivity of our intentional agency set us apart from and above the rest of the living world. Also the notion that what it means to be human, that is how the human is understood and lived, disciplines humanity into those who are fully human, those that are not quite or not yet humans, and those that are non-humans at all. In other words, the belief that some are already humans and that is the rational man and others that are always in the process of becoming humans and never, never arriving there. Like Leon said, education is directly implicated in the creation and the perpetuation of human exceptionalism through its humanist education goals and is also implicated in our well, failure to imagine alternatives. Despite the efforts to promote education as key to achieving sustainable lives, schools and higher education systems continue to prioritize workforce supply for economic growth over environmental sustainability. The Cartesian dualisms that is structure our curricula and our pedagogies are instrumental in perpetuating the delusion that we are somehow separate from the world around us and can act upon, upon it with impunity. So in the face of the multiple existential threats we have brought upon ourselves, business as usual is no longer an option. It is time to step up to the challenge and fundamentally reconfigure the role of education and schooling in order to critically reassess and reconfigure its relationship with humanism, in order to stop using education as a vehicle to prom for promulgating human exceptionalism and its baseline, baseline Cartesian logics of exclusive human rationality and intentional agency. And in order to, in order to radically reimagine and relearn our place and agency in the world and the delusional logics that justifies the hierarchical and exploitative man over nature relations that we have right now. So education has to radically reimagine the notion of the human. To put it in Sylvia Winter's terms, a Jamaican writer and cultural theorist, we have to abolish man so that other ways of performing and practicing the human can flourish. So to be clear, in the Commonwealth Research Collective, we challenge the idea of education seeking recognition for other people or for other entities that have yet not been recognized. To make education more humanist, for example, more sustainable, more, more like in the global north. Instead, what we argue for with many feminists across the world is for an, an education that rethinks the human altogether. So coming back to the questions, how can we envisage education futures? How can we decolonize education futures? In the Commonwealth Research Collective, we experiment with an education that fully acknowledge that humans are embedded within ecosystems and that we are ecological, not just social beings an education that dissolves the boundaries between the natural and the social sciences, 
an education that accepts that the world is not simply ours to study and to act upon at will, an education that resists the heroic impulse to fix the ecological crisis that we have caused in the first place by coming up with a smarter, bigger, and better humans to the rescue solutions. An education that doesn't champion individualism, that doesn't champion rationality, the characteristics of man with capital M, but instead fosters collective dispositions and convivial, reparative human and more than human relations, that we need together figure out what that means. An education that embraces indigenous cosmologies and sacred and ancient land knowledges. The multiplicity of local knowledge systems that Noah was talking about. Uh, the activist movements in the South Americas as well as in the ancient philosophical traditions. In other wor words, we don't attempt to think and act as if the world is singular, but embrace many worlds and many ways to think and do education. An education organized around the principles of interdependence and interconnectedness that make everyone and everything as a part of the Earth's ecological community. An education that makes less human-centered and instead experiments with possibilities for collaborative and collective more than human learning with the world and not about the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica, for that really stimulating uh, talk. Uh, really, really great. Thank you very much. And of course, we'll be taking questions once we've We've heard all of our panelists will be responding to your questions which are building up rapidly in the Q&A so thanks for those keep do keep them coming in but uh, for now I'll hand over to to Catherine over to you Catherine thank you so much for inviting me um, I'm focusing my presentation on effecting systemic decolonization in institutions in the academy itself. Knowing that the agenda for transformation of the academic systems that demands attention is the, the default drive of the academic system itself, the way the disciplines are organized, the way the academy is organized. So um, uh, I draw attention to the basic cultural structures within which our systems of thought have been constructed across the disciplinary domains. We have to think of the need for ethical capacity building and for, bu uh, for building of ethical warriors because uh, uh, to confront colonialism, we have to act in a way that the, uh, does not let colonialism slip back and come back to haunt us. So we have to act as warriors, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to question knowledge leg, uh, legitimation processes, uh, asking what type of knowledge is being generated in the universities and these uh, scientific institutions. Here, I, I put forward some uh, three or four uh, methodologies that have, uh, have, been, uh, um, have been crafting in South Africa um, uh, as the chair in 
development education. One is transformation by enlargement. We know that modernity constricts. We have to enlarge. Modernity constricts us. Eh? So we have to transform by enlargement. This means that we are challenging modernity and that which it has omitted from the knowledge producing arenas. We have to give a schemata that cuts across all sectors and all fields. And we have to seek to expand or enlarge them in the current plural and the, the inclusive paradigm we are seeking for. Secondly, we have to adopt cognitive justice, which means, uh, which means we have to accept that all forms and traditions of knowledge must coexist in public without duress. Cognitive justice deals with the diversity of, of, of the knowledges. It, it comes with transformation by enlightenment in providing a framework for the plurality of knowledges to coexist in public without dress. Thirdly, I propose that we have to uh, to, to bring out transdisciplinarity in action, mm? not in theory and theory and theory, but in action. And we have to link it with leadership building because transdisciplinarity, when you look at it, it challenges the, the partial knowledge uh, that is produced in disciplines themselves and ask them to generate new knowledge. So uh, transdisciplinarity is essential. The fourth uh, uh, method is immersion. Immersion is aimed at people involved in the different levels of transformation. It is a methodology that offers scholars as change agents the tools to effect change through expanding their cognition, in our case, Africa words, in the global sense, uh, uh, indigenous words and humanity words. Uh, 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 fifthly, uh, I call upon us to consider second level indigenization. The second level indigenization differs from post independence indigenization attempts in the, the first focus on inclusion of black people into the game of the drama. But second level indigenization questions the rules of the game and offers an alternative or complementary plot to the drama itself. It engages the paradigmatic frames and the apparatus, the apparatus for value coding and the constitutive, not the, regula the regulatory rules of the system. Lastly, I call upon us to consider uh, this issue of humility. Because uh, if we, 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 uh, we, we have on uh, decolonization, it, I think uh, it makes us stuck in our armchairs. But uh, to, to include humility, we will uh, accept that, yes, 
we we were you know we were wrong eh? and let the others speak let the let us hear the voices of others so uh, for now i i end like this thank you uh, thank you so much catherine for that wonderful talk uh, really uh, reflecting, you know, your years of uh, of of, of uh, engagement with the whole uh, decolonization issue over many decades now. That's much appreciated. Thank you so much. Okay, we have some uh, we have some questions, um, and uh, I'm going to try and uh, and and group group them. So um, there's 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 one. Perhaps uh, that uh, um, uh, Veronica might might think about um, first of all. Um, so so there's so it's really about uh, a, or actually it could be be to to anybody. Uh, anybody can can respond to this, but it's about uh, the current uh, emphasis on PISA and on standardized tests and whether we feel that they actually maintain a, uh, a colonial mindset. So uh, perhaps uh, Catherine or Veronica, you'd care to respond to that? Let me... Yes, let but... me... Uh, the, the set programs can continue actually, eh? but we, we need to enlarge it. Eh? We need to enlarge the, the, the frame of the project itself, rather than critiquing it. You get me? Eh? Yeah, we need to engage much more deeply. And, and the projects um, uh, the, that universities engage in, they are already skewed, but we have to to challenge the university by introducing new concepts all the time and sticking by them. Eh? As I said before, we have to practice our ethical warriorship. Eh? Okay, thank you. Diana, I'll just add that the questions that I think I would ask is what is the purpose uh, of PISA assessment tools? Um, who does it serve? Uh, how is it that it creates? What is the kind of human that is trying to create? Um, and then, you know, is that what we want? I don't think that we are trying to, or at least within the Common World's Research Collective, is trying to propose that we already know what the solution is, but rather how do we come together to think about what might we do differently? Okay, um, whilst, whilst you're, you're there, um, with, there's, a, there's a question targeted uh, directly at you, which is, um, which is about the challenges of embedding um, indigenous knowledge into the in, into the curriculum and the role of justice. So uh, Pablo asks, what role does justice play in the future of education according to Commonwealth's perspective? Thank you. The, the, um... Can, can you say the question again, Leon? Yes. I was trying to read the question, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> yes, no, sure. He's, he's wondering what, what role, he says to Veronica, what role does <laughs> justice play in the future of education according to the Commonwealth's perspective? Mm -hmm. All right. So I think, again, is the justice for, for whom? Um, and I think the Common Worlds Research Collective thinks about ja ecolo ecological justice, to think about uh, eco uh, justice as an overall idea. Um, and I think that part of your question at the beginning was also how do we 
engage with indigenous knowledges. And I think that in order to engage with indigenous knowledges, we have to open up education and think that education needs to be situated, needs to be local, needs to respond to the conditions of the times, the conditions in which children or youth are embedded in rather than trying to create a particular kind of subject that will be simply maintaining neoliberal and, um, and capitalist values. So truly rethinking education overall. Great, okay, that's, that's wonderful. Um, no, I've got one that I'd like to, to direct it at you, if that's okay. Um, so it's from uh, David Watt. He's wondering, will our futures in education now be fully inclusive? Question mark. CF, UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report 2020. So I think he's wondering the, how, your, how your understanding uh, inclusion, the, the idea of inclusion. Sure in relation to the concept of education futures? futures and yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I sure hope so. Um, I think hope is what we need to go on here. A hope and vision and aspiration for um, uh, education systems that are, are inclusive. But I think one of the things that this conversation is really useful for is thinking about the terms of inclusion, right? And really challenging some of the traditional terms of inclusion, uh, because far too often uh, efforts at inclusion have actually uh, perversely ended up marginalizing, delegitimizing, uh, and in fact, excluding. Um, so uh, I, I appreciate the question because it, it, it really forces us to think about the terms of inclusion. Um, what do we mean by an inclusive future? Um, and, uh, I think that's got to be, I mean, as, as, as Veronica was talking and Catherine as well, I mean, that's got to be a future that's got uh, a deep appreciation of, of multiple different uh, valid ways of knowing and ways of being. Um, so I think that's the inclusion challenge ahead of us. Wonderful. And Catherine, if it's okay, I'd like to put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> so that there's a couple of related ones here. Um, okay. So so one is um, what well, one is about uh, decolonizing. It's from um, uh, Jude. And she's thinking, how can decolonizing approaches in education weigh the tension of sustainable development as a Western concept? Uh, i.e. is a, green, a greenwashing a concept that itself is arguably colonial, as critiqued by post-development scholars. <laughs> the, the, the question is very long. Can you <laughs> simplify it uh, for my sake? Uh, I, think, I think what she's getting at is, you know, sustainable development is a Western concept, she's arguing. So how can, uh, how does that fit in with the idea of decolonization? I think uh, we must tackle uh, decolonization itself uh, without linking it with education, with science, with uh, decolonization itself, because uh, decolonization is a framework for oppressing. Uh, also, so and it it it, um, it employs uh, various uh, tenets, uh, including the academy, including the set in sectors, including policy and so on. But we have to plan new concepts. For example, cognitive justice. Uh, uh, I, re I will repeat, cognitive justice is the right of all forms and traditions of knowledge to coexist in public without the rest. Now, if we take that, eh, whoops, 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 eh, we'll say whoops, 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 until, you know, to, to accept that 
all forms and traditions of knowledge must coexist in public without duress, without gunpoint. Eh? That one will open up the space eh, for, for deep dialogue among knowledge systems. Eh? And now I'm running uh, a, a global institute for applied governance in science, knowledge systems, and innovations. What I'm trying to do is to bring uh, people who are genuine, who are committed to, to con uh, contemplate uh, seeing each other for the first time, eh? seeing other knowledges eh? for the first time. So I, I think it, it, it is not about education and science or the, the, the sectors. No, it is about ourselves first. Let us uh, prepare ourselves first and then get out into whatever sector or whatever discipline or something. Um, um, when we prepare ourselves, we will win. We will win. Fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Catherine. Um, so there's one for you, uh, Veronica, now. And uh, it's about um, uh, globalization and indigenization. So I think um, the, the questioner is, is wondering, um, you know, if we prioritize indigenous local knowledges, how does that sit with the reality of globalization in your view? Yes, how does it sit with the reality that this is the world that we have, right? So how do we create an education that deals with the world that responds to the realities that we have, the messy and equal spaces that we have created through human exceptionalism, through nation state building, through colonization. So these are the challenges that we are inheriting and we need to face those. We need to think about how is it that we came to think that education needs to be about including diversity only by thinking that we had a mainstream and then we include, we bring others. So we need to recompose ourselves as not being one world, as not being, you know, oh, it's inconvenient. And I'm, I'm not saying that the person that is asking the questions is saying that it's inconvenient. But diversity is not inconvenient. Diversity is what the world is about. So how do we reconfigure, rethink, create an education system that is always already in the first place, already embracing diversity? Because we don't exist in one world. There are many different worlds. And education tries to streamline things and focus ourselves that there is a world and then we need to include all of the other worlds. Like, let's not start there with that idea. Let's start with the idea that there are many worlds and the role of education will be to sustain those many worlds. How do we do it? We do it in the classrooms. We do it with children. We do it with youth. We do it with university students. We accept the fact that there are different ontologies and different epistemologies. We break down the Western notion of education. Wonderful. Thank you, Veronica. Um, there's a few that have come my way. So I'm going to just very quickly try and address uh, some of those. So uh, one is about uh, the language issue. And uh, you know how can we how can we uh, persuade governments like the government in Rwanda, but also you know the international community about the importance of, of language of, of uh, indigenous languages. 
and of course this is this is a critical issue and it's one that's uh, you know if you ask lots of parents in africa they'd say oh i want my children to learn in english and you ask policy makers and they link english with the whole idea of economic growth and globalization and so on and we need to we need to uh, engage in you know serious advocacy around this issue and one of the one of the um I mean, there's kind of two sides to, to that coin. On the one hand, you know, we're trying to convince people that actually, you know, the idea of untrammeled economic growth is itself problematic, if that's your aim. But actually, you know, the, the, the question of, of, of language, there, there's no, it's very difficult to point to a country in the world that has successfully developed in inverted commas however that's uh, that's defined without actually developing their own indigenous language uh, so you know i think it's a it's a very um it, it's a it, there are lots of misnomers around this and of course you know with when it comes to parents and issues about how their children are learning we know the evidence is, is overwhelming that children grasp basic concepts principally in their in their their own language and then once they once that is the case they're able to then uh, uh, um, work in in other languages and that actually children acquire second language more effectively once they've once they've grasped their own language and of course this is all a a, a class issue apart from anything else because you know for elites living in urban areas where both you know, a global language like English or Spanish is spoken in the home alongside indigenous languages. Those children who are genuinely bilingual in that sense from a, an early age, it's fine. But for, for the majority of our learners, you know, the, the rural areas and so on, they don't have that exposure. So it's at a huge cognitive cost to them having to exit early from, from the, 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 the mother tongue. So we need to make that case as educationalists. Anyway, I'll get off my, my hobby horse there. I'm very, it's a very, it's an issue I feel very passionately about. Um, uh, Noah, I've got a, a question for you from, uh, from uh, Keith uh, Lewin. Uh, let me just go back and see if I can find it. He's saying that, uh, I'm not sure, can you actually see the chat yourself, Noah? Can you see the Q&A? He's, he's asking, uh, multinational bilateral donors have prioritized achieving SDG4. Their advocacy seeks to raise billions of dollars for aid to education over the next decade to ensure all children are enrolled in conventional education systems. Will this hasten or delay decolonization? He talks about his recent article, Beyond Business as Usual, um, gives a reference for that, which we can share later to everybody challenges the conventional view of the role of aid in sustainable development. So I think at the heart of that is uh, really, you know, a question of the extent to which existing aid modalities uh, support uh, the idea of sustainable futures. Yeah, you know, there's, <clears throat> let me tie this into a question that came up. I appreciate the question, uh, Keith. Um, uh, and honestly, I don't know. I mean, to some extent, you know, it's in in the hands of everyone listening to this webinar to try and steer um, things in the directions that we want it to go in. Uh, but let me tie this to a question that came up very early, you know, I, and I think it was in response to me pointing out the, the, the futures in the plural uh, in the UNESCO project and, and someone asked, you know, uh, should we also be talking about educations in the plural? Um, and I think yes, um, clearly we need to be talking about educations in the plural. Um, and uh, you know, will will the uh, the aid enterprise uh, support educations in the plural? Uh, again, I think that's that's for everyone in this group um, to try and and steer um, in that direction. Great, thanks very much, uh, Noah. There was one. Uh, there's one for uh, Catherine. Where are we? Um, 
I've I've lost it. The problem is it keeps uh, it keeps uh, shifting uh, the the screen. Uh, where are we? Oh yeah, from this is from um, uh, Geki Karuru uh, Sabina, and she's wondering to Catherine's point that we need to decolonize more fundamentally rather than thinking we can do it sectorally. Who or what can drive that? So you know she's she's wondering how do you if if you're if you're to take your point about uh, decolonizing fundamentally. Uh, rather than sectorally, how how do you achieve that in practice? And you have to um, to to roll back uh, my screen a little bit because uh, as maybe you know, I was the architect behind South African policy on indigenous knowledge systems. I wrote that with a team of people and we decided that indigenous knowledge systems itself, it covers uh, many, many sectors and many so-called disciplines. But in, in order to, to let institution understand what indigenous knowledge systems is all about, they must invite co-experts coming from the villages so that they, 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 they look at each other face to face. Yeah? The professors plus the elders. Yeah? And you, we don't just talk about indigenous knowledge and, and like that but we bring the, the knowledge holders in public. Eh? So eh, I think uh, uh, South Africa has, has done a lot, but it, it needs people uh, who, uh, to use my words, ethical war, uh, warriors, because if we think that bringing change is ch some kind of uh, um, uh, joke or something like that. We are mistaken because you you, you have to 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 think like a warrior. Now, uh, now I'm meeting the first obstacle. Okay, uh, um, uh, uh, next week I will meet the next obstacle, and in one year I will meet this. You have to prepare yourself first. First. You know, otherwise it is just a joke. Great, thank you very much uh, indeed for that, uh, Catherine. Um, okay, so so there's a few about um, uh, a, a few more about uh, decolonization um, and the idea of decolonization of uh, epistemic justice. I'm grouping together a few questions here, but to what extent is even our understanding of these terms, you know, in need of, uh, of decolonization? But to what extent do we, do we frame uh, our debates around uh, justice, for example, uh, in, in Western terms? And I think there, you know, the reference point is uh, liberal democratic um, traditions. So I, I don't know uh, whether, uh, Veronica, you'd like to, to have a go at that one. Um, I could start um, and, and maybe shift into another question in terms of uh, some of the, the challenges that someone asked um, about what are the, the, the possible challenges in steering the decolonizing education moving forward. But to go back to um, uh, the question of justice, um, it's like justice, again, justice for whom and justice um, when. If we see ourselves as separate from the world, as um, having to obtain justice just for us, 
we are going to respond to edu through education in a particular way. If we are thinking about ecological justice, because we are not separate, we as humans are not separate from the world, justice is going to look very, very different. And I think we, we do have uh, a lot of examples of how justice could be something different than justice from a liberal democratic Western perspective. Uh, many indigenous knowledges, indigenous ontologies, epistemologies do not begin from just justice for human beings, but begin with ecological justice, environmental just, justice, a world that is uh, united that doesn't make a difference. So perhaps we have to learn more from other ontologies and epistemologies than Western ontologies. And Leon, perhaps, is it okay if I go to address? Yes, of course, please. All right. Some of the, uh, the challenges that, um, that we see in terms of having centuries of Western epistemologies being addressed in education and what are the possible challenges in steering the decolonizing education moving forward. I think that one of the main challenges that we have, and perhaps Catherine is, um, was gesturing towards this idea, are our capitalist temporalities, that we cannot think outside our capital, capitalist temporalities that demand instant results and always results that are knowable and predictable. When, if we don't understand that this decolonization, colonization to get to here took centuries, it's going to take a very long time to think decolonization and to figure out together how are we going to engage in decolonization? How are settlers, migrants, indigenous peoples of the lands go going to come together to think together? That is going to take a very long time and it's outside of the capitalist temporalities of instant gratification and outcomes that we have. So we need to, again, reconfigure who we are and how we think. So education, how do we do this on the ground? Perhaps we begin with education in, with children, bringing in other temporalities. How do we exist in this world? Even with very young children, I work in early childhood education. Can we be in the world? Can we foster and nurture with children other temporalities that will allow us to create the conditions that are necessary to begin to think decolonization? Brilliant. Thanks, Veronica. Okay, we're unfortunately we're beginning to draw towards the end of, of the session today. So um, I'd like to um, just in, uh, ask the panel uh, just to, to uh, perhaps make, uh, just sit back and just uh, maybe reflect on what we've discussed. And I'll ask you in a moment just to perhaps give some, uh, some uh, wrapping up, uh, one or two points just to wrap up. Um, but we've, we've also uh, asked one or two people in the audience uh, just to give their reflections. Um, and I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to ask, um, uh, uh, oh, where, where is it? Um, uh, Moira Fall from NORAG, uh, just to give one or two comments. But before, before I come to you, um, Moira, I'm going to just read out a, a, a takeaway from Tanya Spronk uh, from SIL, um, who says, my main takeaway that I was able to capture came early on in Professor Tickley's assertion, I hope it wasn't too assertive, but the recognition of learners and teachers, diversity of languages and their entire linguistic repertoire is key and less discussed issue in the decolonization discussion. Um, indigenous knowledges are encoded in the languages and can't be separated from each other. 
So needless to say, Moira, I agree with, uh, sorry, Tanya, I agree with you. <laughs> um, but of course it's not, it's fraught, these issues are, are not straightforward. And, uh, you know, there was a, a, a colleague from Nigeria has pointed out, you know, some of the practical issues of having, living in very linguistically diverse societies and how you then prioritize or, or it, uh, foster all of the indigenous languages. It's, it, these are complex issues. Uh, maybe we can return to some of the practical issues in uh, next week when we talk about putting some of this, uh, when we focus more on practice. Um, but for now, I'd like to invite Moira, if you're, if you're there, Moira, um, uh, just, to, just to give uh, one or two reflections, if you would be so kind. Um, perhaps you could just introduce yourself first of all and uh, state your position. That would be helpful for the audience. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Moira Fall, as Leon said, and I am the executive director of NORAG, which is the Network for International Education and Cooperation Policies and Development in Geneva, the Graduate Institute. As you can see from my day call, I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, and I was just so grateful to be part of this conversation today. We just um, have had a tour de force in cutting edge thinking here from thinking through the critical issues of how a colonial past and colonized present affects how we live, think and learn and teach and research. And of course, measure value and how that economic system that teaches us that value goes in one direction only is really not um, is not uh, doing what it needs to do. And then how we can actually move from in education, moving from business as usual to reimagining and relearning. And then that powerful call for action uh, from Catherine as well, this call to warriorship to also question those rules and practices that underpin and perpetuate our current system. Now, the, the quick uh, piece uh, that we did with Futures of Education in July was focused on um, ed education and emergencies. And one of the sub themes there that was very popular was in fact, this question around decolonizing education and emergencies as well. And it's just absolutely critical, particularly in higher education, that you know, research as a culture is resistant. Um, and as difficult as the moment is, it is actually a good time to be working in this area. And this core idea of sustainability that is required to redress these economic, environmental, and social injustices that stem from the problems caused by the current paradigm, and that is what the decolonization community is questioning, challenging, and acting to unmake and therefore remake the futures of education. Thank you so much for this session today and for the future sessions. I'm very much looking forward to them. Thank you, Moira, for that uh, really wonderful contribution. Very briefly, uh, please, uh, can I call on um, uh, uh, Sean, uh, Sean Adebayo, uh, if you could uh, please just uh, give your uh, very brief comments. We, we're almost out of time, so please do make them brief. Okay, doesn't look as if uh, Sean's with us. Let's wait, uh, let's move on then. If Sean, if Sean is able to give some comments in a, in a moment, that will be great. But let me return to the panel at this stage. And, uh, and just ask if, uh, if uh, each of you could just give a very pithy uh, two or three sentences, a summation of, uh, of, uh, of what, you've, uh, what, what you'd like people to take away on the basis of our discussion today. So let's uh, start with you, uh, Noah, if, if we may. Sure, uh, pithy. <laughs> uh, I, I really appreciate Marvo's comment about unmaking and remaking. I, I see uh, ideas around that across the conversation over the last hour and a half. Uh, I think that's useful because it, it reminds us as much as we talk about learning and the necessity of learning, we also need to think about some unlearning uh, that needs to occur. Um, so, uh, you know, 
figuring out ways to recognize the constraints that have been placed on us by the current systems that we live in um, <clears throat> and to disrupt them. And at the same time to make room for alternatives, you know, and I think that's, uh, you know, a key thing we've seen here. Uh, and maybe, maybe the final comment would be, you know, there's so much talk in education circles about innovation and, and kind of remaking and reinventing. Um, okay, we need to do some of that. But I think what uh we've seen today is that the alternatives already exist right let's not ignore um you know the countless existing practices that uh will take us in 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 much better directions uh thank you so much noah veronica Yes, Shad, just two, um, two sentences. One to um, note that, yes, I think we all agree today in terms of the and a change is needed, that we need to change education to challenge the principles and the goals of Western education. And like Noah said, we do have examples of how to do that. The, the piece that we didn't have time to, to think about is that perhaps we need to bring other ways of thinking uh, into how we think about education. And one of them might be bringing in a speculative thinking and a speculative visions. And that is something that perhaps the topic for another, uh, for another discussion, but let's, perhaps think with speculatively, particularly I am in the work that I do, I'm very much inspired by the children that I work with. And what if we bring in children to think education with us, not just us thinking what education could be? Brilliant, lovely. Uh, Catherine, before I come to you, I, I see that uh, Sean has now joined us. Sean, are you able to give a very, very brief, please, uh, contribution, takeaways for us? Thank yes, you. Yes, please. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Leon. Uh, this has been quite uh, a great and insightful seminar. So my name is Shira Adebayo. I'm from Nigeria, but currently a PhD researcher at the School of Education, National University of Ireland, Galway. And I'm working on culturally responsive uh, teaching and learning in Irish schools. Um, so I think uh, from this um, seminar, my major takeaway is this, that we need to do more thinking around what sustainable futures of education mean for different contexts, uh, as well as thinking around uh, what factors such as political, economic, or social factors um, can um, influence our understanding and conceptualization of uh, sustainable futures for education, because I believe how we define and how we see things actually you know influences uh, the outcomes of, of such uh, uh, conceptualization thank you. brilliant thank you so much sean and i'm sorry to rush you but uh, catherine the last word to you before we we, we end today uh, very very fitting it is too that you should have the last word <laughs> uh, you know I, I wrote in the chat we are we are in the grip lock in epistemology actually now eh? because um, we want something we want something and yet we are locked you get me eh? so we are locked to to undo that locking hmm? we have to think of what the keys could be to the various padlocks we have all over our uh, our uh, our legs, our necks, our arms, and so on. Eh? We are locked, eh? so we have to to think very deeply on, of how we should we should attain self liberation first, and then we can liberate others. Thank you. Wonderful. What a, a, an inspiring note to end on there as well, Catherine. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to the other panelists, uh, Noah, Veronica, uh, and uh, a thank you to my co-convener, Keith.
thank you. A special thanks to Christy uh, for, for helping facilitate this, uh, Christy Smith, and to my colleagues, Julia and Raphael, uh, and Artemio for their, their technical support during today's session. Most of all, thank you all very much, all of the participants, for your wonderful engagement with, our, our, with the ideas today. Uh, it will make an, an important contribution to the Futures of Education initiative. We'll make sure of that, that we record and, uh, and forward your, your ideas. And, uh, and we very much hope, look forward to welcoming you to the sessions next week and the week after. So, but for now, thank you all very much. Uh, stay safe, keep well, and uh, we we'll hope to see you all very soon. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>